Welcome back to this week of uh, the Music Bar Podcast. Thank you for joining us, Dan. Thanks, Chris. And, uh, yeah, um, bit of a sad note this week. Ooh, it's been only a couple of days. It has been very sad. Um, yeah. Obviously, uh, Meatloaf has passed away, and you're a pretty big fan of Meatloaf, aren't you? I, and I think I've always been a fan of Meatloaf. Mm. And you, you kind of go, oh, yeah, Meatloaf. And then you get off, and then you go back and you go, oh, yeah, Meatloaf's great. And then you, he brings out some songs that aren't great, and you go, oh, yeah, Meatloaf. Well, does a live performance of the NRL and well, it's not great. Well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> I, I, I will, I can't not mention that. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, um, but, yeah, when it all came down to it, it was kind of like, the. F- I, I've mentioned it before on this podcast last year, in season one, yep. My the very first album I bought with my own money was Bat Out of Hell. Oh, really? Okay. A cassette at a record store at Devonport. You know, in Tasmania. I told you that, in Tassie. Yeah. I was there for my... So because we had relatives there, I was there for my Christmas holidays and I had some money and I was obsessed with that record. And I think the main thing was... I mean, first thing, if you knew nothing about it, was I suppose the thing for me, like, I'll go back, go back a bit, was the first thing was you heard, you took the words right out of my mouth came out in 1977. And he was this big, fat guy. Yeah, 300 pounds, they say. Yeah, he was huge. He lost a lot of weight in subsequent years. But when he came out, he was a big, big guy Mm. with long hair. And he didn't look like a rock star. No. He didn't sound like a rock star. But this song sounded absolutely huge. And Mm. I remember it was just played on the radio all the time. 1977. Seven, I'm uh, eight years old, going on nine. So, you know, 77, it's just AM radio, there's no FM, and you're hearing Meatloaf singing, you took the words right out of my mouth. And then the next one was two out of three ain't bad. And as a kid, I never liked slow ballad songs. I always liked big rock songs. But gee, I couldn't stop listening to two out of three ain't bad. Oh, Oh, that, that song just had me. Yeah. And then when I was allowed to go into the record stores to look at records, I was no longer looking going into toy stores. I was into record stores. And, I, you know, the Kiss album covers. In the 70s, they had great album covers. Mm, they did. You know, Alice Absolutely. Cooper had great covers. And, you know, David Bowie had amazing, and Kiss had amazing covers. And this Bat Out of Hell, the red cover with the motorbike coming out of the grave and the bat and the guy, the dead guy on the motorbike. Yeah who looked nothing like Meatloaf. And you just looked at this and went, this must be the greatest album ever recorded. It has to be. Yeah. It looks so good. And the two songs I've heard are great. Mm. I think just I, you, you heard it by osmosis because everyone kind of bought a copy, whether on record or cassette. And I remember that hearing the opening chords of that first song, Bat Out of Hell, which was just... It's three minutes, that opening segment of the song, yeah. of the instrumental build-up to mm. the song. And it, it just, like, it was the most amazing thing. It was, it, and I think even to this day, you could either go, oh, Meatloaf songs are so long, or you just sit there and listen to it and you think, this is incredible. Yeah. And yeah. as I grew older, I realised that a guy called Jim Steinman, who I loved as well, wrote all the songs because it had in little writing down the bottom songs by Jim Steinman. Yeah. The album was originally supposed to come out as Meatloaf and Jim Steinman. Okay. Yeah. And they, the record company kind of didn't see how they could sell Meatloaf and they, they put Jim Steinman in little writing, in little writing down the bottom. But Steinman became his own thing as the years went on. And a lot of that music was recorded or written originally for a rock version of Peter Pan in theatre, wasn't it? That's correct. And yeah. there is it, all those songs, including ones from Meatloaf's follow-up, Dead Ringer, Jim Steinman's solo album that he came out with, Bad for Good, and some of the songs from Bad Out of Hell 2, have all been reworked into a musical version of Bad Out of Hell. Now? Yes, which oh, was okay. supposed to play in Australia last year. It got delayed twice because of COVID. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and then, but it's apparently coming next year, and I'm going to go see it. Oh, you have I've heard the because it's it's arranged. The songs are in a different order. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not in the order as they were on the album. Steinman and the show writer 
arranged everything yeah. in, in such a way. But um, Meadlife himself was such a theatrical performer. He was, he was. Yeah. And as a kid, and as I have grown to learn, and as you have just discovered, Bat Out of Hell was massive in Australia. Yeah, it was, actually. Um, when you texted me the other day after I mentioned to you, have you heard about Meatloaf passing away, mm. you said to me in a text that he has, that album is the biggest selling album in Australia. Mm -hmm. I questioned that. You and did? And I went and looked, because I just could not believe that someone who's an international artist, especially someone who hasn't really done anything for such a long time, mm. um, had more sales in our own country than Whispering Jack. Or ACDC. Or ACDC. Yeah. And I went and looked at it, and it was right. 25 million. Um, oh, no, 25, 25 sorry. 2.5 million or something like that? Whatever it was, platinum. Oh, yeah, 25, 25 times platinum. platinum yeah. Yep. And John Farnham, Whispering Jack was 24. Mm-hmm. And that really blew me away. And that was 1977 compared to 19... What year did Whispering Jack come 86. out? 86. 86. Mm. So it's really shocked shocked me that Australia took hold of Meatloaf and even Jim Steinman said on the um, show I watched the other day, um, it took about a year for us Americans to get onto it. Yeah, the, the, and it seemed to be around forever. Music was a bit like that back in those days. It's so quick now. Everything, mm. everything is, is over almost as soon as it starts. Yeah. But, um, yeah, an album like Bad Out of Hell, which only had nine songs on it, no, seven, so seven songs on it, uh, all of them absolute killer. You know, we've talked yeah. about Thriller and um, Def Leppard's Hysteria, and but Bad Out of Hell was just this almost perfectly constructed record. Yeah. But it was also, um, how would I put it, you couldn't say it was influential because no. who else came out with that type no of one. record? No one. It was like, I wonder if people actually sat there and went, oh, we'll never copy that. And that, that's why you look at the um, classic albums show, mm. they they went to so many record companies and everyone was basically saying, no, no one wants to listen to this. Apparently, um, what's his name? The The... Clive Davis, the very famous record company guy, you know, he he's the guy who basically told Santana, here, record with different singers, make it sound very contemporary, okay. and came out with Supernatural, which sold bucket loads of Peace. records too. Um, they When they went to him, he said to them, this is not rock and roll. You have no idea what rock and roll sounds like. Mm. And he gave them money to go down to the record store at the bottom of the building and go buy some rock and roll records and listen. Yeah. Everyone said it was theatre. Yeah. And because the way they tried to sell the record too, well, they didn't make a demo tape. No, you they, sang it live. They sang it live. They went to the record companies. It was Meatloaf, Ellen Foley singing and Jim, Jim Steinman Simon. on piano and played it live to them. <laughs> Can you imagine just how everyone just kind of went... You get, <laughs> even the fact that, you, you know, Meatloaf walks into the room and starts singing... Like you said before, he's a mm. big guy. He's not the um, most attractive front person. No. But he just did it with his voice. Yep. And, and I was... still can't believe they said no to him originally, but apparently they were, like, creating record companies just to say no. It was a joke. <laughs> I know, it was had a joke. so many uh, no's. But, they, yeah, they, it was they literally, funny. They, they, and it wasn't, it wasn't until um, Todd Rundgren, who produced the record, he financed it. And, yeah, yeah. Because he believed that he had a deal with Warner Brothers Records, and he believed that... Um, he they would distribute it, and even they went at the time once the album was completed. Yeah, the album was completed, and still no one would release no one, it. Yeah. It was, wasn't until some guy I've heard of him, um, Joe Papp, his name from Cleveland Records, and a lot of these are old record companies that don't exist anymore because yeah. they've all been been bought up, and there's literally only three record companies now. To be honest, um, they released, they heard it, and they released it. And it went, did all right in America for a while, but in Australia, we hooked onto it straight away. Straight away. Yeah. It makes me also wonder what, why. Yeah, I know. Why, why, what were we doing in this it's country? It's funny just looking back at the sales, mm. even Michael Jackson Thriller only had 16 times platinum in Australia. In Australia. But bat out of hell. It's bad like. Because <laughs> when Meat Life died, I mean, like, Jim Steinman died, and a lot of artists are dying now, and Charlie Watts died, and people went, oh, yeah, what a great drummer. But the outpouring of people on Meat Loaf has yeah. been phenomenal. Well, I've been talking to people all week about it, and they've been mentioning me. You know, I posted something on our Instagram about it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm not the hugest 
fan of Meatloaf, but you'd have to love his songs for what he did. And because um, I'm a metal fan, there is that kind of element to it. The, this you theatrical, but it's got the guitars and the music of mm. it. And his singing just justifies both styles. It did, it did appeal to a metal crowd, yeah, didn't it? it? Did. And it, it still did. does. It appeals to this. Yeah, you're right. The big over. Blunt, the the big arrangements yeah. and you know you, and you probably do hear but out of hell and probably think well I could hear where James Hetfield's getting all those long intricate mm. songs that Metallica and all those um, power metal bands from yeah. Europe yeah they definitely were listening to but out of hell because it was huge in England too I think it was the it stayed in the English charts for over eight hundred weeks it was oh, the longest run of and this is how big. Meatloaf was, you know, it, it, we we don't. I think everyone's starting to see it now. Yeah. Not until someone dies that you look back on their career and you think, "Oh wow!" You realize, but what a debut! I mean, it wasn't technically his debut. He would brought out an album before that with a guy called Stony, called Meatloaf and Stony. Oh, did he? Yeah, know. it was just all bluesy soul sort of numbers. Okay. But it's when he hooked up with Jim Steinman that they went. Well, he was uh, auditioning for a theater show. Yep, and he walked in and auditioned, and <laughs> Jim Steinman was like. That's who I need yeah. <laughs> to sing my song. What was the song? The way I was. I think the song he sang was "I Wish I Was as Heavy as Jesus," <laughs> and Jim Starman apparently said to him, "You're you're not heavier than Jesus. You're heavier than two Jesuses." <laughs> but yeah, apparently yeah, Jim was one of those little sun on it, you know, things. But I love the um, the whole thing of um, like Todd Rundgren. When you watch that classic album, Todd Rundgren, who's very sarcastic. Um, just kept saying to him, <laughs> these songs are so long. And every all these things I read about the making of that record, they said Todd just sat at the desk the whole time going, these songs are so long. Yeah. And what is it they said about Bad Out of Hell? It was seven minutes into the song. And it's like, oh, now you want to get, with this song still going, you want the guy's dead and now you want to keep going. <laughs> Is that with the motorbike? Correct? Yeah. I mean, oh, what about the motorbike thing? What is? I know that's a solo on the guitar. It's pretty amazing. It was really amazing the way really he good. did that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He just sort of plugged it in, went right, hey, let's go, and just did that solo. And then if you hear that all in one track, it just it's, it's a guitar sound. It's a guitar playing a motorbike sound, and all of a sudden it goes into a lead without a break. Without a break. So obviously the guitar player knew what he was doing. He that was Todd himself. Yeah, Todd Rundgren to be able to do the the sound of a motorbike. Mm. No one would pick that. Listening to the album that it wasn't actually a motorbike. No, I remember when I was a kid, I was like, oh, I thought, oh, yeah. they've got motorbike sound effects, but yeah. it was a guitar. And yeah, it just kept going and going and going. I know. Songs. It was just, it was just something else. It was else. so entertaining. It's like Bohemian Rhapsody in a sense. Yeah, but it's, I mean, that's it's entertaining. It does, yeah, yeah, it was a similar sort of, I suppose, when you mm. think, because Bohemian Rhapsody was such a hit, so when Bad Out of Hell came out, it probably just didn't sound so weird. Oh, maybe. We already yeah. had Queen who were doing big bombastic songs but it was the length of the songs on Bad Out of Hell yeah it was the the absolute I remember reading listening to the album the first time in, in its entirety and I, I'll give you an indication how long the album came out I bought that tape in December 1979 oh, so that was yeah. two years after the album came out and I still went into the record store and bought it we yeah. were still listening to it yeah. two and a half years after the album came out so you know, it showed the, long, the the longevity that that song, that that album had. But uh, I remember the last album, the last cut on the album, um, for crying out loud. Um, I remember it goes for about uh, nine minutes, and it's in three parts. I just remember the first verse went for about four and a half, five minutes, or so, almost three minutes, and it and it comes down to this low, and then it starts up again. I'm thinking, it keeps going. <laughs> this song just keeps going. <laughs> You're waiting for it to stop. Continue. I was waiting for it to stop so I could finish the album and probably go to bed because I was tired because I was only a kid. And I'm like, it keeps it going. Doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. Well, I think also when you say about the theatrical side of it, Alice Cooper is very that way too. And it's, then Kiss were around too doing the same mm. kind of theatrical thing. So it kind of probably wasn't scaring people off that much anymore. That's why he probably stayed in the charts for a while. Meatloaf didn't have a stage show as such. Oh, he right, okay. was... He was a show. He was the show, yeah, yeah. so to speak. And you probably saw on that classic albums one, they said this 300-pound yeah. rock, Pavarotti-type rock <laughs> guy falling. And, like, he, he ruined his voice. Yeah. He absolutely... He wasn't a trained singer. He was a very much an actor. Hmm. He started out as an actor. He's who could sing. How many movies are over 100 or something? Oh, yeah. Fight Club. 
Yeah. Oh, he was Bob Paulson. He was so good in Fight Club. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, I was watching a bit the other day from um, the Tenacious D movie and the best bit of the film, which is he's in at the start where he plays the religious dad. Oh, yeah. yeah that's from the Twisted Sister. Um, no, no, no. He's um, singing to the kid who's the young Jack Black. Oh, and he's, you've got to God. worship the Lord when you're in my home. And it's really well done. I thought it was taking off that Twisted Sister song. Oh, and then... The kid closes he the can't. door and there's Ronnie Dio there and yeah. Dio then says, you know, you've got to go and rock and don't forget. But I thought that was wonderful. But Meatloaf, and I think that he, had, he was this very expressive mm. guy on stage. And, um, you know, you, you, you sort of, I think we, we tended to forget that Meatloaf was primarily an actor and a performer mm. who, could, who could sing. He had a great voice. But as he got older... Unfortunately, his voice wasn't that good. He never looked after it very well. You know, for no. a guy who was a singer, you know, like by the time they finished with Bad Out of Hell and he went to record the second album, he didn't have a voice. No, and he was rec- uh, singing so much, like six times a week. Mm. They were playing as much as they could to get the name out there. Well, they toured everywhere. Yeah, so six times a week where most mm. operatic singers would see Priest sing two yep. times a week. Yeah, Meatloaf was, they were doing six shows a week. So he did it to make sure that he was known and get the album out, but then unfortunately it ruined his voice for really the last two albums. Mm. For the rest of his life. He, yeah. You hear it on the second album, Dead Ringer. He's singing in a completely different key and a different style. Mm. And you can hear all oh, that, that's not quite there, the voice. Yeah. He got it back a little bit, but yeah, the... He, 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 he did lose it, yeah. you know, in, in that regard. But um, I have, I what, probably another thing that hooked me on Bad Out of Hell was um, yeah, years later, I think in the early 80s, uh, some reason on the ABC during summer, they were playing this uh, Old Grey Whistle Test, which was a live show coming out of um, England. Okay. They would, and some bands would go, and you see some really interesting stuff on the Old Grey Whistle Test. And Meatloaf sang Paradise by the Dashboard Light mm-hmm. with um, Carla DeVito playing, because they said they changed to the Dark Ed Girl. Yeah. It looked better than Ellen Foley, who had long, straight blonde hair. You know, Who was actually on the recording. Who was on the recording. Ellen Foley was on the recording. Carla DeVito did it live. Yeah. And um, they did Paradise. And it was so... Are you watching it? And it was so theatrical because they... They started doing the makeout scene for real on stage. <laughs> he's got his tongue right down her throat, and his hands are all over her and groping her. I saw that. And she's like, you know, and and then so the, when she does the stop right there, he's like out of breath. He's like, <gasps> and and yeah, and I remember watching this on TV and thinking, wow, <laughs> I've seen people at karaoke. Do Paradise by the Dashboard Light, and you think, no, nah, you, you, unless you're doing what me like, <laughs> and Carla DeVito would do it, it, it just doesn't have that effect. It was really, even back mm. then, I was just like, wow. And if you look at it on YouTube, you'll find it on YouTube. Yeah. It's such, and it'll give you a good indication of what the show, what Meat Life really was about. Yeah. The whole thing. And then, of course, he had a few, after that, he had to declare bankruptcy. They didn't oh, make really? a lot of money, even though Bad Out of Hell sold, well, they reckon they're talking figures of 50 million around the world. They reckon they made pennies from it. They they all ended up broke, which is unfortunately the music business, how it works for a lot of them. 43 million copies they sold worldwide. Jeez. Bad Out of the Hill. And it was what I read yesterday. The album sales are soaring at the yeah. moment and the streaming is soaring. At, and you said... Yeah, well, come on, I think... Is it I, I, was one of those I do anything is, for love, probably? I think it was, yeah. Number yeah. four in um, UK at the moment. Um, I think it reached number eight originally. And now it's number four in the and UK. Now, I think, I'm not sure in the title, though. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was that one. Probably that one. Well, that one was kind of like the big comeback. He brought out a few records in the 80s, which didn't do a lot. But mm. it was when he reteamed with Jim Steinman for Bad Out of Hell 2 in 93. And at that time, I've got to remember, I was right into Nirvana. I was into all the alternative music. So... Uh, by that stage, I'm like, oh, Meatloaf. I was yeah, a bit yeah. like that. Oh, yeah. Meatloaf. But that song came out, and it went number one. Mm. It was all of a sudden, everyone went, we love Meatloaf again. Yeah. And I remember watching it thinking, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Jeez, I like Jim Steinman. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was, in, he was in part of number three, wasn't he, Jim Steinman? He wrote some he songs. Child. Yeah, he wrote some songs. But him and, G- him and Meatloaf feuded a lot. They feuded a lot. And... 
they ended up, there was a lawsuit over who owned the trademark of Bat Out of Hell. Right, okay. Yeah, because I think, you know, Jim was like, well, I wrote it, I created it, but Meat was like, but if it wasn't for me... It wouldn't be anything. It wouldn't be anything. They came to an understanding, but they did come out with a record in last one together called Braver Than We Are. I don't listen to it. It'll honestly, it'll tarnish any good feelings you have about Jim Steinman and Meatloaf together. Is that Bad Out of Hell 3? No, Bad Out of Hell 3 is called The Monster Is Loose. Right. They came out with one in 2016. It's Meatloaf's last record, Braver Than We Were. Oh. Don't listen to it. I'll have to say it. It will tarnish anything. Meatloaf's voice is shot and the songs are just not. And that's Jim Steinman. Yeah, they're just not there. Mind you, it's got its fans. You get online and I found a lot of people love Braver Than We Are, but I listened to it and I actually found it yeah. unlistenable. Which kind of brings me to because of Meatloaf with his voice. I, a lot of people haven't brought this up, and I'll, I'll give him credit, but Meatloaf is rather famous, unfortunately, in Australia too, because I think we were all excited about the AFL Grand Final when we heard Meatloaf was going to perform there. Mm. Knowing how big Bat Out of Hell is, I thought this was going to be something. And he came out giving a very... What could only be called an odd or strange performance. Some people said it's downright terrible. I remember watching it thinking, I don't know, what's he doing? I'm not quite sure. Yeah. He was off key out of, not, it was almost like his, his um, hearing, hearing stuff or the oh, monitors yeah. he had in his ears weren't working and weren't he, was, working. he couldn't hear the, he couldn't hear his backing music or something. It was almost like he, he was really out of whack with his band or, or something. And many people have lampooned him and blasted him and said it was the worst thing ever and all that sort of stuff. But the other day, I found online that tour, it was 2011, a concert from the Sydney Entertainment Centre. On that tour, he's killing it. Oh, really? He killed it. And I thought to myself, I think probably the sound was not fine. His voice wasn't great, but what we always forgot was Meatloaf was an actor and a performer. Mm. And it was all this, he, 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 he wasn't, he doesn't sing the songs as you remember them. He didn't sing them as you remember them. Like He gave a performance and probably did a different interpretation of each song, each song yeah. every time. Like Eddie Van Halen and his guitar solos. Yeah. Didn't play the same thing. I think Meatloaf never did the same performance twice. Mm. Just got that feeling watching this live video because I thought, well, this is that same tour. Yeah, yeah. And he's, they're killing he it. Well. Him, him and his band are absolutely killing it on stage. Sure, he didn't move around a lot, but he had the, you know, like people have said, you know, he did the hands and the and the wiping of the brow and all that sort of stuff, you know. And he, he, he did it all like this big, passionate sort of show. And, yeah, he he certainly, he, he certainly uh, was, was something else. And, mm-hmm. oh, look, I... I'll take my hat off to Meatloaf in, in every way imaginable. And it's just that lovely memory of um, my first album I ever bought. And that's probably why I had this, I mean, apart from the family thing, that's probably why I've always had this thing about Tasmania. Because <laughs> that's where I bought that, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I, I went and listened to it and stuff like that. You're and only I, one town away from me, that's why I, mean, I was I know. six or seven. I know. <laughs> would have ridden my push bike over and said, hi, Chris. <laughs> you don't know me, but would you? You don't know me, but listen to this. One day we're going to be talking about this. I can tell you this right now, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> I, look, I never saw Meatloaf live either. Um, no, me either. Kind of wish I had, probably a bit earlier. I would have been... Imagine going to see him in 78 with that. Oh. <laughs> you couldn't imagine anything in his career. That time would have been the best. That would have been the best, wouldn't it? That would have been the highlight. That Australian tour when they were fresh, when they were hungry and they were excited yeah. and the... And the they couldn't do anything wrong, really. And that band was really tight. You know, as I said, that old grey whistle test, mm. that, that band, which they called the Neverland Express, because they were playing that every that night. That was the name of the, um, the play they were writing for, wasn't it? Neverland. Yeah, that's Neverland. right, yeah, Neverland. That's that's exactly that's right. That's, so that's, yeah, so Jim Jim Steinman. Um, and I, I have this theory, this, this my, my little theory about meat is... Um, you know how they say sometimes there's old couples and if one of them dies, then like a year later the other one dies, you know, mm-hmm. of a broken heart? Uh, maybe Jim died yeah. and less than a year later Meatloaf died. Did Meatloaf have a broken heart? Did Jim's death break him? Because there's a Rolling Stone interview where Meatloaf's really like, starts crying during the interview. Oh, wow. Yeah, he starts crying. So it's like, 
I wonder if he died of a broken... But they were speaking on speaking terms again, weren't they? Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. They were definitely... I think they had one of those, yeah, you know, I hate you, we're best friends. Yeah. I can't live without you. Yeah, they'd be yeah. where the moon was positioned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think they had all that. So, you know, valet me, me life, you know, it was just one of the biggest... If not, one of the biggest guy in rock and roll, and <laughs> definitely, a, you know, I think we forget just what a su- and superstar he is, and uh, Scott Ian's father-in-law too. Is he? Did you know that? No. Is he really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> there you go. And because yeah, Scott Ian's a fan of everybody. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Look, um, when me and my brother were discussing, because who's he got tattooed? Malcolm Young. He's got a Malcolm Young tattoo mm-hmm. on him. Plus, he loves Kiss. Yep. Yeah, and his father-in-law is Meatloaf. There you go. There's yeah, no Scott Ian's married to Meatloaf's stepdaughter, Pearl. Right. Yeah, who sang backup for Meatloaf on a few of the tours and stuff like that. So, yeah. Keep in the family, <laughs> eh? It's crazy. It's like Jimmy that. Barnes. They're like everyone. Yeah. They're all in musicians and stuff like that. Yeah, Imagine is. in this country when Jimmy Barnes dies. Oh. Or John Bunnell. Yeah, I tell you what, you know, we're not getting any younger now. It was anyway. bad enough when Michael Hutchins passed away. Imagine if that was like in the year twenty twenty two. Oh, jeez. Because you think about, it, I remember we always would discuss that when I was working at um, working at Triple M. It was always that, um, jeez, you know, when someone would die, it was always a, you know try and get something on the air. But we're always like, imagine if Jimmy Barnes dies. Mm. What 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 are we going to do that day? Well, what, what's the programming going to be? Because all people would want to hear all day would be Cold Chisel and Jimmy Barnes songs. Yeah. You know? I know. And yeah. yesterday, speaking of uh, people passing away, it was Eddie Van Halen's birthday yesterday. I saw you put a little of, tribute uh, there. 26th of January. He would have been 67. Yeah. So he's been... I, I saw you put a little tribute there, Chris. Yeah, well... Still, still I'll see it gets you. He's my hero. He was your hero. Still is. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, sad day for that. But, yeah. Um, Gosh, it's funny how we, we should be celebrating. I mean, I, I like to look at it as a celebration. Well, that's what I've been doing. I've been yeah. listening to Meatloaf for a week. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I've, even during Battle of the Hill, I was driving my work truck, and here I am listening to that, and I'm getting chills over myself. You I know? Just, <laughs> I'm just like, wow, this is amazing. Funnily enough, I've been listening to the second one, Battle of Hell 2. Oh, really? Oh, I really love the big full 12-minute version of I'd Do Anything for Love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the... It's so stupidly huge and you do listen to it because the version you hear on the radio is the edited six minute version and you think to yourself why why does it need 16 bars at the front start of it when it could only have used four four <laughs> well what did Todd Rundgren say in the classic parody Paradise by the Dashboard Light they had that whole thing of we're going to go all the way and it was and he was a big Broadway yeah. all the way all the way keep going. Go, keep going and keep, four lines <laughs> go all the way tonight go, go. this song's too long it's so four times only not yeah, sixteen yeah, not sixteen times <laughs> yeah four times the song's long enough just no one none of these will ever get played on radio yeah, yeah. so anyway Vale Meatloaf Vale and Jim Steinman you together meet Eddie Van Halen happy birthday for what would have been. Your um, 67th birthday? Mm-hmm. Yeah. God, yeah, too long. Uh, look, well, we've got a bit of time, Chris. Yes. I just want to mention about our um, last last episode. Mm-hmm. We were talking about the the gig at Fisho's, Fisherman's <laughs> Wharf. Nirvana. Yeah, I got a bit of feedback from that episode from a friend of mine who said, sent me a text. Remember when we discussed yeah. it? I said, there's all these people who live here on the Gold Coast, where Chris and I are, yep. who all say, yeah, I was there at that gig. Yeah. Kev, who... Owns this, owns, this place. owns this place. I was at the gig. I, you know people who said, I was at the gig. I yeah. know people who say, I was at the gig. I worked at a radio station. People, I was at the gig. It's like... And if you know Fish O's, Fishman's Wharf... It was a, not it a... Was, was a big, <laughs> it was a big... It was a big... So venue. over time I'm moving here for me, hearing people talk about, how many people went to this thing? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody went to this thing, but I don't know how they fit it all in. Well, a friend of mine who listened to the podcast, Malcolm, thank you. He texted me and said, yeah, I was at that gig. <laughs> I texted him back and said, no, you weren't. And he said, yeah, I was. And he just, he said it was heaving. It was just like, because mm. I think if we're looking at dates, yesterday was the anniversary, the 30th anniversary Australia of that gig. Day. Australia Day, 1992. And yet, um, yes, I think the Gold Coast came to a complete standstill as everyone rem- reminisced. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he said he, he turned up with a friend of his who... Um, 
he lost at the gig. Yeah. And back in those days, when you lost, you lost. Yeah. You don't have the phone to call and say, where are you <laughs> yeah. on this spot? You just don't see him again for the rest of the day. He didn't see him for the week. A week. <laughs> he saw him a week later. <laughs> That's the, the good old days. <laughs> Which worked really well if you didn't like the person. You go, oh. oh if you're just turning up at a show with somebody. Yeah. But, yeah, nowadays you can just sort of go, I'm right behind you. Or, you know, <laughs> you can text them or say something. But, yeah, so another friend of mine has said. He was there. He was there at that gig. He drove down from Brisbane. Because I remember the, I've said the Brisbane gig sold out. It was a festival hall. Mm -hmm. But, obviously, everyone took the, everyone just made their way to fish shows and just decided. Let's I'm, see if we can get in. Let's see if we can get in. And, luckily, the management and ownership went, come on in. <laughs> Are you going to spend money on booze? Do so we know the actual the, the, the figure? Look, everyone speculates. 10 to 16,000. Well, yeah, Kev, Kev here said 16. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot. That is a lot for a place that big. Yeah. I, I, Even look, 10's too many, I think. 10's too many. If, 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 look, I can't say Kevin was wrong. Kevin, no, I can't. He was I, there. He was there. And, and um, I believe he was. I reckon nine would be a... <laughs> this, place could, this place couldn't even hold yeah. 2,000. So... It's <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, but Malcolm did say it was uh, heaving, sweating, which is exactly how Kev described it yeah, too, didn't it he? Was actually. <laughs> it was packed. You were in the. What did he say about buying a drink? You had to. You'd buy four. You'd buy four. And hopefully you get them back to where you want to stand and drink them before they get spilt. But yeah, you yes, buy yeah. four at a time. By the time you start drinking, the, the fourth it's already warm. Yeah. But you just wouldn't get in the queue otherwise. That's you right. Get, you wouldn't get to the front. That's right. You never bought one. Yeah, you had to buy four at a time. That's yeah. right. Just for yeah. yourself, not for your friends and you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> just, just for, for yourself. yourself. Yeah, you had to buy four drinks. Yeah. So anyway. But um, before we go, we yeah. have to do cool, cool thing. Oh. Remember? That's right. Cool thing. Have you got something cool I've for the cool, week? Cool oh, you thing. go for it and I'll think of my cool thing. Okay, so this week's cool thing for me. Oh, I like this. Um, you might have seen the episode of Get On It where Dan mentioned a band called Jane's Addiction and oh. an album called... Ritual De Lo Habitual. Yes, that's the one. And he said in that um, episode, the last four songs changed his life. So I went home and I went to work the next day and I listened to what was going to be those four songs. And the first song of those four was called Three Days. And I haven't got past Three Days yet. That song, to me, is amazing. Yeah. It's so cool. And I was wondering why when I was... Because that came out in what year? 1990. 1990. So I listened to that kind of music back then, but I didn't listen to Jane's Addiction. And I was trying to figure out while I was listening to this, why well, haven't I heard this? I knew the song before that. Mm, um, been Caught Stealing. I've, been, I've heard that a few times. I saw it on that, the radio all the time. Yeah, that was the big single from the record. Yeah, yeah but I didn't like it. So <laughs> I just wouldn't have put... But I think me being a Metallica fan back then and influenced so much by Metallica... And watching the guys in Jane's Addiction, the way they dressed and the way they acted, mm -hmm. I just went, not interested. Mm. Until now, over time, you know, a lot of years later, a couple of decades later, I'm listening to it. And I'm like, I can appreciate it and not really care about the way they looked. And I have now discovered Three Days. And that song wow. to me is amazing. And wow. I have listened to it over and over and over again. I wouldn't say it's changed my life, but it definitely added to my life in the music genre oh. have a great song. So oh, Chris, I definitely. feel like I've done a per public service for you. <laughs> well, put it this oh, way. It makes me feel good. I wouldn't have heard it if you didn't mention that, so I love the fact that we do get on it, because it does, even me, mm. I hear things I don't normally listen to, and I love it. So, yeah, I thank you for oh. for bringing it up. But Thanks, Chris. Addiction, give it a go. That song is just amazing. Thank you. And <laughs> you. My cool thing for the week. Okay, then. Look, I'm going to go for a movie. I'm actually going to go for a movie this time for mm -hmm. my cool thing. Um, I have been, basically, I've been trying to find movies by the director Brian De Palma, an American filmmaker, and uh, I watched an old one of his called Carlito's Way with uh, Al Pacino and Sean Penn, because mm -hmm. I kind of have to watch movies basically episodically because I'm always getting called. I get two minutes into a movie, Dan, Dan, from everyone. Brian De Palma, is he part of the... Um, Ron Howard? No. No, Brian De Palma was a sort of in the league of um, Spielberg, Lucas, Francis Coppola. Right. They all came out at the same time, the early 70s. Brian De Palma's um, The Untouchables is one of his oh, films, right. which is one of the greatest movies ever made. Um, he made Scarface, 
Yep. And uh, made Carrie, the first one of them. He's made some really cool films. He's also made some real crap ones, but he's made some very cool films. And Carlito's Way is pretty damn cool. So why have you chosen him well, specifically? I've, because no one talks about him in the same um, sentence as Francis Coppola and, oh. and, and Spielberg and such. Yet he was definitely one of their contemporaries, and they were all friends. Um, Brian De Palma was the guy who basically told George Lucas that after he showed them all a rough cut of Star Wars, the story is that it was Brian De Palma who said to him, this thing makes no sense. Mm. This movie makes no sense. I don't know what you're doing. No one cares. Who, you know, you start with two droids in a spaceship and then they land on a planet and then they get, you, I don't know who the main character is or anything like that. And he was the one who said, you got it, the, the opening scroll of Star Wars. That was apparently, Brian, he, it was Brian De Palma's idea to say, you've got to kind of have some sort of thing at the start of the movie to tell people oh. what's happening. Why, why do I care? Why am I invested in this film? So, so you don't read the beginning scroll. You yeah, if you, th going on. if you think about it, yeah, and no, it's probably yeah. true. But Brian De Palma is also a guy who definitely made films very much his own way, very unique style, really good with the one long take shots. Um, a movie called Snake Eyes is a great opening shot. It's all done in one take. Mm. Um, yeah, he's and he used to do split screen. I've been watching a few things of his. There's one I'm trying to get called Phantom of the Paradise which came out the year before Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, just lots of really cool film styles. Uh, probably maybe be accused of being style over substance, mm -hmm. uh, but you've got to remember the, the untouchables that scene in the train station with the, um, the pram going down the stairs oh, yeah, and yeah, the yeah. shootout around that. That's the kind of thing Brian De Palma can do very well. So when he's good, he's fantastic. And um, when he's not so great, um, it, it can be a bit awful. But, yeah, right. that's my cool thing. Cool. Well, we'll leave it there. Um, this is episode three of season two. So wow. thanks for joining us. And um, please subscribe. So tell your mm. friends. Tell your friends. And watch the Get On It's during the week. And, uh, mm. yeah, have a good week ahead.